Where's the bobblehead Spurgeon? It's right there. It's right there. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> you know, I don't think I have that one. <laughs> I have two other bobblehead Spurgeons, you but I don't think one? I have that one. All right, here we are today with uh, David Guzik. Uh, David hails right now from Santa Barbara, but when I think when I first met you, um, you were just transitioning out of Simi Valley to Germany. That's right. I think I still was in Simi Valley, but not for very much longer. Right, and you were senior that. pastor there. That's right. And how long were you there? I was in Simi Valley for 14 years. Oh, wow. We okay. founded the church, and I pastored it for 14 years. Okay. And and you left there to go to Siegen, Germany, to what, plant a, like a Bible college? Right, right, to start up a Calvary Chapel Bible College campus, which ended up being a small international Bible college there in Germany. And yeah. that was a great experience. Yeah. We were there for seven years. Wow. And, and then prior to Simi Valley, you actually planted a church in Oxnard, California with Lance Ralston, I believe. And I don't, I'm kind of unclear about how that all happened. Well, it's interesting because last weekend I was with my good friend Lance Ralston and his congregation there at Calvary Chapel Oxnard right. celebrating the 40th anniversary wow. to the same week of when we had our first service at Calvary Chapel Oxnard. And what we did was just a couple of young guys. I, I was 19 years old when we had our first <laughs> church service. Old. Lance was in his young 20s. Wow. And we uh, put together two home Bible studies okay. that we had been teaching. And yeah. we pastored the church together for six years. Then we transitioned and Lance became the senior pastor. I was there for an additional year, so I was seven years total okay. at Calvary Chapel Oxnard. Yeah. And uh, boy, those were great years, Lance and I serving together. Amazing. It's, we, we look back on real appreciation and a bit of amazement on yeah. those years. Well, yeah, so young, I mean. So young, and you know what, it was funny, it's fresh in my mind because we just had this 40th anniversary last weekend. Uh, we, we had nobody looking out after us. <laughs> We weren't planted by anybody. I mean, we could have gone off and been a weird cult or something like that, but instead, God really used um, used us to teach and guide and mentor each other in a super organic way. Yeah. It's not like we were intentionally doing it, but as we look back now, we say, ah, that's what God really did. So, so you guys were not like a Calvary Chapel plant or anything like no, that? No, we weren't oh. sent out. But we, were, we were two Calvary Chapel guys. Right with very much Calvary Chapel backgrounds, okay. who decided, hey, we've each got home Bible studies and the people in our home Bibles aren't going to church anywhere. Hmm. Let's put them together and start a, uh, a, a Calvary Chapel in Oxnard, which is a community uh, hour, hour and a half north of Los Angeles in California. So from Oxnard to Simi Valley to Germany, Germany, then back to Santa Barbara. Then took, to Santa Barbara, right. Took, took a church there. That's right. And how long were you pastoring there? I was the lead pastor at Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara, succeeding our good common friend, Ricky, <laughs> Ricky Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. Uh, I was there for seven years. Wow. Okay. And then I turned it, and we still attend that church. Yeah, yeah. I'm on the website as teaching pastor, <laughs> but that just means I teach there occasionally. Yeah, you come on our radio station as pastor of Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara. You know what, we Still leave that on the radio station because there's kind of no other good explanation and I'm happy for Calvary sure. Santa Barbara to yeah. get a little bit of you know <laughs> press or something like that. And, and so now tell me how, uh, I remember coming to Germany a couple of times and uh, you were there uh, doing the Bible college, but you were also there, you had an office and it seemed like maybe that's when you were beginning, or, or maybe before that, hammering out your commentaries and stepping into that world, or was that previous? That was previous to that. Okay. When I was at Calvary Chapel, Simi Valley, uh, one year I went to the Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference. It happened to be the first year that they had it at Marietta Hot Springs. Oh, okay. And so I was there at that conference and I heard a guy stand up and he said, um, uh, hey, uh, we're putting together this Bible resource site called Blue Letter Bible. Yeah. If you have content for us digitally, teaching notes, commentary, whatever, send it to us and maybe mm. we'll put it on it. Okay. And I decided I would send it because one of the things that people could know about myself and Lance Ralston, in the mid 80s, I was really kind of following Lance's example, early adopters of computer technology. Oh, wow. 
I I was preparing my teaching notes on a computer in the, 80s. In the mid '80s. That's that. It was, was early. It, was it this big? It or? was huge. It <laughs> was. It be. was. Yeah. I, I wish I could show pictures because it was huge. Yeah. And and it didn't even. Anyway, it's just old technology. Right. But what that meant was that by the time that guy got up and spoke, I think it was 1996 when he gave that invitation. Uh, I had already had 10 years of wow. teaching notes okay. in digital format. So I sent them up there. And what I found out from that is that what I prepared for myself as teaching notes was valuable to other people mm. as Bible commentary. Right, yeah. So when I was at uh, Siegen, Germany, doing the Bible college, my commentary had already been online for, oh, you know, when I got there in 2003, so then it had been on for seven years. And so, yeah, my commentary predated my time in Germany. Which, but I definitely continued to work on right, it and right. further it there in Germany. Was it, was it called Enduring Word at that time? It was. It's kind of interesting. You know, I didn't need to have a name for it when it was on Blue Letter Bible's right. website. But when it kind of started, I don't know, people seem, at least some people seem to find it useful. I said, well, you know what? Maybe I should have my own website. Maybe, maybe I should uh, uh, have some books in print. Maybe yeah. people would yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And so that you kind of have to come up with a name. And I'm terrible at thinking up names. <laughs> and I, you know, it's kind of funny because I thought that the name Enduring Word was really kind of lame. I wasn't really happy with it. But you know what? As years goes, I'm, I'm, I'm plenty uh, happy I, with it now. Uh, I can't think of a better name. Oh, it's a great, it's a great title. It's so, better than <laughs> David Guzik Ministries. Yeah, right. <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> no. So, so tell us a little bit before we get into answering some questions about Revelation. Tell us a little bit about uh, enduring Word. What is it? How does it work? Uh, what are some of the different, you know, caveats of the Enduring Word? I know it's more than just a commentary, right? It is. What we're seeking to do is get out uh, my Bible commentary and related content right. uh, in as many platforms as possible. So we have a website. That's where most people access my commentaries from our website. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an app that a lot of people find very helpful. We have translation projects in 12 or more languages with a lot of dedicated subdomains. We uh, have podcasts that get a lot of exposure. We have a YouTube channel that gets a lot of, you know, uh, gets the resources out that way to a, a growing audience. All right. I do a weekly question and answer live program on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. We do a daily devotional, both on podcast and on um, uh, YouTube. We put out new content all the time and improved commentary content. Right, right. We have version Bible reading plans that are really starting to get some traction, mm -hmm. not only in English, but we translate them into, I think, about six different languages wow. as well. Uh, so that and other ways that aren't coming immediately to mind, we just look to get yeah. our the Bible teaching resources that I have out to a, a audience. So if someone wanted to go to your website, is it EnduringWord.com? EnduringWord.com. Okay, yeah, great. So you were just here here at Coastline this week. You, you did kind of an overview of the book of Revelation. Right. You spoke this Sunday on chapter 10 of Revelation. Right. And we had some people write down some questions. And so we might just kind of go through a couple of these and pick your brain. Like here's one from someone who said, and this is an interesting question, and I think we talked about this a little bit. Why will there be animal sacrifices in the millennial reign? And he quotes Ezekiel chapter 43. And, and that's an interesting question because here's Jesus ruling and reigning, and yet we have animal sacrifices going on. Okay, I have to say that is one of the more problematic questions kind of in my understanding of prophecy. Right. Now, now, people who just say, look, everything, it's all symbolic. Nothing really means anything literally. It's no problem for them because they just say, well, <laughs> right. yeah. Who cares about having non-symbolic uh, 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 sacrifices that aren't even real? Just nobody cares. Yeah. But for us who say, no, we need to understand that when the Bible speaks prophetically, it, it's speaking about things that will really happen. Of course, yeah. So... The best explanation, and, and I would reference this questioner, uh, go to my 
Bible commentary on those chapters in Ezekiel, mm-hmm. because I deal with that in some depth there, but I could kind of summarize the answer to this question just by saying, I believe that the best solution is, is that those sacrifices are, number one, they're not for the atonement of sin, sure, but they are both a kind of a memorial, a recreation. Uh, there is a sense in which when we receive the bread and the right. cup of communion, we're memorializing what Jesus did. Yeah. We're looking back to it. Or, or as you would go today to Colonial Williamsburg or something like that, you'd see. And, and I think it'll be just sort of a, hey, this is how our forefathers did it. There's that aspect. But there's also another aspect. The sacrificial system of Israel concerned much more than merely sacrifice for the atonement of sin. They sacrificed for a dedication unto the Lord, mm-hmm. for thanksgiving. Right. There were fellowship offerings. Yeah. Uh, there were uh, dedication offerings. So th- there can be sacrifices made that aren't for atonement for sin, because sure. that's really yeah. the contradiction we would find. Right. There is no more animal sacrifice for the atonement of sin because Jesus' work on the cross paid it all. Certainly. So I, th- I think there's ways, even though I got to say it's it's like, wow, l- look at this. There are ways to understand that in a way that doesn't violate that principle. So it'd be, be more of honoring the Lord and looking back to the way in yes. which they honored him and, and made him sort of the, well, gave their first fruits, so to right. speak, to the yes. Lord. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's a great question, though. A uh, couple more, we'll just, we won't spend, uh, this is, you know, this is something I think that um, is apparent to everyone, but it's an interesting question. Why all the anti-Semitism against Israel, it seems that they've always been discriminated against. And of course, we see that all the way back, you know, to the birth of Jesus, when when they sent them to uh, Bethlehem, and sure. I mean, we, we see it all the way back to that. So what do you, what's your comment on that? Well, I, I don't mean to dispute this questioner's vocabulary because they're just using the common vocabulary that we do. Correct. But I'll take issue with, an, er, with a word, anti-Semitism. Yeah. Because Semites are Jewish people, Arabic people, you know, people. That, and when somebody says anti-Semite, they don't mean anti-Arab. Right. I think anti-Semite is a polite way of saying Jew hatred. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about hatred of the Jewish people. Yeah. And as I look at that, both historically and in the present day, I, I think that the only adequate explanation for it is that it is inspired by Satan himself. Yeah. It's demonic that such a small segment of the human population right, yeah. should be so hated and so actively campaigned for their genocide throughout the centuries. Uh, the, the, the adequate explanation is before the time of Jesus, it was because Satan knew the promise hmm. that his conqueror, the Messiah, would come from the Jewish people, sure. and that was motivation for him to destroy them. Hmm. Since the coming of Jesus the Messiah, Satan knows that the Jewish people still have an important role in right. God's unfolding prophetic plan, mm-hmm. his plan of the ages, and for that purpose alone, he hates them and wants to destroy them. Maybe in Satan's insane self-deception, he feels like if he could destroy the Jewish people, he could somehow defeat God's plan. because. They have a role in God's plan to the oh, yeah. very end of the age. Totally. I mean, obviously, it goes all the way back to the garden. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't find any adequate human explanation no, for no. why they should be so hated. Yeah. So will people get married and keep having kids during the millennium? I sure believe so. You know, the, the millennial earth is not heaven. Now, Jesus right. said of heaven, no marrying. There's people who are not married or given in marriage, yeah. and they don't have children. But the people who populate the earth, and I'm not talking about uh, God's resurrected people, the church who, who would rule and reign over the millennial earth. I'm talking about the citizens of the millennial earth. They're going to be flesh and blood human beings just like us. Right. 
and so yeah i do believe that they will um that they'll continue to propagate the earth in, uh, in the uh, millennium and of course prior to the millennium a lot of the population will have been destroyed yes so a population won't be an issue maybe half the earth or more yeah. of their population here's something else to consider too i think there will be very rapid population expansion in the millennium because we know from passage i want to say it's in isaiah that people's lifespans will expand during the millennium. Mm. It's said that the person who dies at 100 years of age, it'll be said as if they were a child. Wow. So we see these radical lifespans, long lifespans mm -hmm. uh, on the earth before the flood. Right. I think there'll be something that returns to those long lifespans during the millennium. Yeah kind of off that question speaking of that the long lifespans prior to the flood and then you know you it's only you get to the sixth chapter of genesis and the yeah. world's destroyed yes yes so so your th my thought was because of those lifespans the, the world could have been heavily heavily populated during the times of noah absolutely yeah absolutely pretty crazy so um you, you made a comment during your your teachings uh, this week here at coastline about um our lifespan right now mm -hmm. being kind of really short. We're like a vapor, appear yes. for a while, vanish away. But that in this lifespan that we have now, looking forward to what lies ahead eternally, that God might be preparing us for some unique job in the millennia or, or for all eternity, and that he is now equipping, preparing, readying us for some whatever you want to call it job some ministry. future duty yeah that he might have for us yeah, that's an interesting concept I, I think it is and i think it helps explain that that look there may be things that we experience or have to go through on this earth that that really don't have any adequate explanation right. in the here and now but in the eternal perspective especially what God may want to prepare us for, for some future responsibility in his millennial earth. It might make perfect sense. It's kind of like, why me, Lord? Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, what did I yeah. ever do? Uh, uh, here, here's, here's an interesting, and this is a, a probably a, maybe a simple question, but in my experiences, this writer says, this questionnaire says, I have met many, many Christians that avoid reading or even studying the book of Revelation. Why do you think that is? Okay, well, John, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the one in your church here at Coastline. You guys are the ones going through the book of Revelation. Right, right. Well, why do you think that is? Well, I think because it's obviously very difficult to understand, and there's so many uh, different uh, happenings in it that, well, from our perspective here, we, we, we can't get our heads around it. And mm. I think some people are actually uh, believe it, it's it's just symbolic. So right. So why study it? Are that it's it's all something that you can never understand, it, and 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 they they don't really well. I think sometimes people don't really know the Old Testament too well. That's right. Which helps explain the New Testament, and so when they get in there, they go, I, I can't make sense of this. So so why should? And there's a lot of, uh, I can remember even people in my own biological family, mm. who when we went through it the very first time here in the church, who said, I don't want to come because it's too scary. Wow. And I don't want to hear it. Yeah. And because sometimes people have um, the fear of God's judgment, and they just would rather not hear it. Yeah. So, yeah. But it, it's an interesting thing that some people, in a lot of different churches, I think you made the statement too in, in your teaching today on Revelation chapter 10, that people don't want to hear the bad stuff. No, they don't. And, and when you get into Revelation, especially when these judgments start occurring— it's pretty radical. The little book that John was commanded to eat in Revelation chapter 10, it was both sweet right. and bitter. Yeah. And we, we, we have to receive both yeah. in God's Word. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, people don't want to see, receive both, obviously. that There's, there's a lot to, you know, uh, laying down your own life sometimes yeah. and denying yourself. Um, it's it's a difficult process. It is, and, and and the book of Revelation, you know, I I would I would say even for myself, uh, it's hard sometimes to discriminate between what's imagery and what's real. It is. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'll give you an example from Revelation chapter ten. I really didn't talk about it too much here in this sense, but 
okay, John, there's no doubt John saw this mighty angel that's described in Revelation 10. Right. Well, will anybody else see it? Right. I, I mean, I, I don't think that necessarily this mighty angel will stand on the earth during the Great Tribulation. I, I mean, we're really not necessarily told that Mm-hmm. But John saw it in his vision, right. and John's interaction with that an- angel was very important for the book of Revelation. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that angel will appear on earth during that day, because John won't be on the earth <laughs> right. in those days. Yeah. So anyway, it's, th- there are, there's, there's, it's definitely a different kind of book than anything else in the New Testament. So you mentioned in your teaching also in that, well, you opened up, I think, your session, mm-hmm. um, your first session talking about chapter one, right. what Revelation is really all about, and it's not so much about the judgments, although it is, but um, Revelation one kind of gives the whole purpose for John's time there in Patmos, which which would be what? You would say the whole book of Revelation is all about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. It's revealing Jesus. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we see that in, in every aspect, in somehow or another, it needs to come back and point to Jesus mm-hmm. in his work and his work of doing what God the Father gave him to do. Yeah, you know, I can't get away from those verses in the Gospel of John where Jesus says that his Father has entrusted all judgment to him. Hmm. You know, Jesus Christ is the loving Savior who laid down his life. Right. He is also the judge yeah. and the righteous judge. Yeah. And uh, a, a lot of that is the expression of that judgment in the book of Revelation. Well, I mean, even when Jesus was here on earth, uh, he was very loving, he was very kind, he, he was very compassionate, mm. but he also had some righteous anger at times. Absolutely. I mean, he demonstrated it in, in many ways. And he um, was very, um, I guess you would say, rough on some people sometimes based on their way they misinterpreted God's character to people. Matthew chapter 23, those woes to the scribes (laughs) and the Pharisees. Man, that's a heavy chapter. And Jesus really laying it out. And again, it's just those things weren't absent from his first coming, but they weren't the dominant note of his first coming. It'll be different than that in the second coming. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. The difference between the lamb and the lion. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which is a powerful image. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's interesting when, when he begins this whole judgment thing that they see him as a lamb that was slain from the foundation mm-hmm. of the earth. So here is this lamb that you don't expect to see bring judgment. Yes. But that's who he is at the heart of all things. He's a, he's a sacrifice lamb but holds the power and the ability to judge as a lion. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful image. And he's a perfect judge. Yeah. You know, we, we think in human terms that's impossible to have a judge who never shows partiality, to have a judge who always understands perfectly all the relevant facts, the judge who always has the courage to make the exact right decision. Right. Those things are impossible on a human level. But Jesus is that perfect judge. I trust Jesus to set up and administer that kind of kingdom on this earth because he is. He's a completely righteous, perfect judge. So, you know, there's a lot of people who have a problem with um, what we call the pre-tribulation rapture. And and I've heard people say things like, well, you know, that's just people who, who want to escape any kind of difficulty in life. And they think, you know, well, I'll just be raptured. I don't have to worry about all that stuff. And they sort of see it as a cop out. And um, they make the statement that, you know, you know no, you're going to have to go through some difficult mm-hmm. times in order, you know, to, to get into heaven. What, what's, what's your response to that where people say, you know, believing in the pre-trib rapture is kind of a cop out to, you know, going through difficulties as a Christian? You know, it's possible that somebody could misapply what I regard as the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture to be careless, Mm -hmm. to be, you know, um, just kind of a wimp and not want to make any sacrifice or undergo any suffering. But that's not a necessary consequence of believing that. That's someone who misapplies a biblical truth. And John, 
every biblical truth can be misapplied. <laughs> right. Every biblical truth can be exploited. So that, that doesn't deny that whether or not the pre-tribulation rapture is something true is something to be determined from the scriptures, not what people may do or not do with a particular mm -hmm. doctrine. And, and I think more than anything that the counter argument can be made. If someone really believes in the pre-tribulation rapture, they believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ could come today. Right. And if properly understood to translate into a person's life, to make them watch and be ready for the return of Jesus, just as Jesus commanded us to do so in Matthew chapter 24, then that makes a person ready and right. filled with anticipation. Yeah. And certainly, if you look at church history, those who even believed in the pre-tribulation rapture did not escape suffering and 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 you know all kinds of persecution. I mean, that's the history of the church. Well, and it's the recent history of the church. It's been said, and I you know obviously it's a little hard to talk about statistics like this with precision, but it's it's probably true that more people were martyred for Jesus Christ in the 20th century than in all previous centuries combined. Yeah, that's a radical statement. The, the, the church, if the rapture were to happen today, nobody could say that the church just kind of cruised in ease. <laughs> no, into no. Now, certain segments of the yeah. Western church yeah. have had that experience, sure. but that's always been true in church history, that there's been some areas that have suffered more, some areas that have suffered less. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know that you know we have had, had here in America, we've obviously had a, mm. a different experience yes. than everyone else in, in these areas where they had to lay down their life for their faith. And, you know, I think based on that, some people think, well, we've got to go through some tough times. And, you know, I, I think every Christian, however, goes through tough times. None of us are exempt from it. And we may not be facing a sword or, you know, being taken to prison, but when Jesus said, you know, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, we all have to go through that process of die, dying and denying ourselves daily. And I don't want to make too much of the words of that passage script that you just quoted, but Jesus said, take up his cross, in the sense that my cross isn't necessarily your cross, right, right. isn't necessarily the cross of a uh, believer who lives in China right now and might be facing persecution, mm -hmm. or who lives in the Middle East and might be facing persecution. Um, we, we can't choose our own cross. God appoints it for us. Yeah. and. You know, that's that's in God's wisdom, not ours. Yeah, and, and, and we all have to embrace it. Yes. I can't get someone else to embrace my cross. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I want to make um, my cross seem super exaggerated, more difficult, and everybody else's cross is insignificant. Right. But it's really not that way. Listen, God knows, and God appoints that. Yeah. He, he appoints ways that each one of us need to trust him and die to self. And that's just different for, for each individual. So, so if you, you were to take the, the book of Revelation, say you had uh, just a, a very small uh, you know, space of time and, and mm. someone like me were to come to you who had no knowledge of the book of Revelation and say, so, so Dave, tell me in a nutshell, what is the book of Revelation all about and why should I pay any attention to it? I would say it's, first of all, it reveals Jesus Christ. Right. It reveals Jesus in a way not contradictory, but from a different angle than the Gospels reveal Jesus. Mm -hmm. So first it reveals Jesus as he was revealed to John directly in chapter 1, right. to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, and then from chapter 4 to the end of the book of Revelation, it reveals Jesus as the conquering Lord of all history, who's going to return in glory and judge the earth, and that we need to be prepared for his coming. And at the end of it, it tells us some pretty amazing things about heaven, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've really enjoyed the, the weekend that I've had with you all here at Coastline, 
But if there's any one regret, you know, we've hardly talked about heaven right, at all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and chapters 21 and 22 are some of the most amazing passages in the entire Bible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th- there's a lot of heavenly hope, and we're almost given just enough information about heaven to whet our appetite, <laughs> but right. not to satisfy us at all. Right, right. Well, we certainly appreciate you being here and enjoyed the, 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 the overview of Revelation when you kind of got into the different viewpoints of Revelation, mm-hmm. the way that people approach it, and, and just being able to reconnect with Dave Guzik. And, um, you know, on behalf of Coastline Calvary Chapel, thank you, and I hope to have you back again sometime. Thanks, John. I've enjoyed it. I hope to come back again. Thanks right. so much. <laughs>